Good morning. Praise the Lord. We are a family of faith, African Methodist Episcopal Church, here in the community that is called Saint, uh, excuse me, that is called Red Hook, in the island that is called St. Thomas, in the territory that is called the United States Virgin Islands. God bless you. I am Pastor Charles Lee Brown Jr. And it is 11 o'clock. We, we are excited for this opportunity to worship and praise the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. And so join with us now as we praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. 
and made known one of the told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as they had been told them. Amen. This is the Lord of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. In heaven and nature sing. In heaven and nature sing. God, we praise you for this opportunity to hear a word from you. We need to hear from you. 
We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, what will we do? Wanting you more each day. Show us your perfect way. There is no other way that we can live. We need a word from you, Lord God. So come, so we can live, even in the midst of this trying season. Help us, Lord God, by giving us your spiritual vitamin that we might run on and spread joy to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So good to see all of you here on Zooms. For those of you all who are watching on Facebook, God bless you. For those of you all who may be watching or listening through some other medium, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you again. I am Pastor Charles L. Brown, Jr., founding pastor of Family of Faith, African Methodist Episcopal Church. And it is preaching time. And I praise God for uh, Reverend Deborah Finley Jackson, who gave us a scripture, Luke, the second chapter, verses 18 through 20. I want to thank God for Reverend Andrew Jackson, who prayed prayed us up and has been working the magic with the technology. We praise God for the technology. Amen, amen, and amen. The scripture's already been read for our hearing, so I'm going to go right into the Word of God. Our theme for this third Sunday in Advent is preparation produces joy. Preparation produces joy. So, two Sundays ago marked the first week of Advent, and last week I explained the meaning and the symbolism behind the Advent wreath. One week we focused on the Advent theme of hope, and we learned from God's Word that despite the drama of 2020, preparing for Jesus' coming can give us hope because we have endured the struggles together, even when we felt like we were all alone. And secondly, preparing for the coming of Jesus brings us hope because it forces us to confront the reality that what we are going through is temporary and not Permanent. So that was two weeks ago when we talked about the theme of hope. Last week, we celebrated the theme of peace. And we learned from God's word that the suffering made manifest this year may drive the world crazy. But for believers, it ought to bring us peace because the peace that Jesus gives us is different from the peace that the world tries to give us. The peace Jesus gives us is derived from the very heart of Jesus' life, the all-embracing sphere of his joy, his love, and his life. And furthermore, our suffering ought to bring us peace because just as Jesus told the disciples of the drama and trauma that they would endure because of their allegiance to him, so too are we going through all kinds of drama and trauma because of spiritual wickedness in high places, which God's word has already warned us about. And I don't know about you, but there's something comforting about recognizing that the word has told us exactly what would happen, and when we reflect on it, 2020 shouldn't surprise any of us. This week, 
we transition from the theme of peace to the Advent theme of joy. Churches all over the globe are united this week in celebrating the Advent theme of joy. And as we explained last week, the candle, which represents joy in the Advent wreath, is pink. And that's why I got a little pink on today. Pink is one of the colors of Advent used during the third Sunday of Advent, also known as Gaudet Sunday in the Catholic Church. Now, pink or rose represents joy or rejoicing and reveals a shift in the season of Advent away from repentance and towards celebration. The third Advent candle is named the Shepherd's Candle or Candle of Joy. And it represents the joy of the shepherds it, that they exuded after having sought the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes because of the angel's announcement. The word says in verse 17 of chapter 2 that, quote, when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd had told them. End quote. Verse 20 says, And when the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The joy we celebrate of the shepherds emanated from the announcement of the angels for they themselves said that they were bringing good news of great joy for all the people. The good news is that on this day is born in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And then the angel begins to tell the shepherds what they will see before they see it. The angel tells the shepherds that they will find a child wrapped in, swat, in strands of cloth and lying in a manger. Then the story shifts as a multitude or an army of heavenly hosts suddenly appear, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace goodwill among people. Once the angels leave, the shepherds say to each other, we need to go and see for ourselves what the Lord has made known to us. So they hurriedly, or they went with haste to Bethlehem. And when they discovered Mary and Joseph and the baby exactly as the angel had described, they spread the word. And in returning, the shepherds personified the same joy that the angels had. And they began glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told them. Now, hearing that sounds like a beautiful Hallmark TV show on Lifetime Channel, doesn't it? Sweet and wholesome and inspirational. But to be honest, given what God has revealed the last four Sundays, this narration of the shepherd's joy doesn't fit what God has been gifting us with lately. And in case you need reminding as to what God has been imparting to us through his word here at Family of Faith, let me help you. During Thanksgiving week, God showed us in his word how we need to mature and become advanced thanksgivers. Not waiting until after God has done something for us to react to it, but to thank him in advance for who he is. Then, the following week, we gave 
when God gave us the title, Preparing for After This, we learned how looking forward to Jesus' coming instills hope in our present reality. And then last week, we learned that redefining peace and remembering what the word has already told us and that what we are going through matches what the word has already told us should be the impetus to change our perspective about our current reality and give us peace because of, not in spite of, our suffering. So for me, to see the shepherds rejoice, not in preparation for, not after they have been told, but only after they see Jesus the Messiah, it doesn't align with advanced thanksgiving. It doesn't align with preparing for after this. It doesn't align with when suffering brings peace. The joy of the shepherds happens at the very tail end of the story in reaction to seeing Jesus with their own eyes. But in 2020, people are hurting and they need joy now. Jobs are scarce, but fake news is not. Trauma and anxiety are prevalent, but access to resources to fight them are not. In 2020, I need a God who can help me get my joy back now. Not just in the by and by. Jesus taught us, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is. In heaven, I got to preach on the on the Lord's prayer soon. In other words, God, it is so bad. We need your people need you to provide provision today. Give us our daily bread today. Just like we know that you will provide when we are in heaven. Again, this this shepherd scene doesn't fit the pattern because it suspends the joy until after they see Jesus. And so, on this third Sunday in Advent, where we celebrate the shepherd's candle of joy, I ask God, what am I missing in this story that is causing the story as we know it to seem misaligned with what God has been giving us for the past three weeks? So when I asked God, what am I missing? He directed me to verse 8. Quote, in that region were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over the flock at night. End quote. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they, the shepherds, were terrified. When the angels come to bring an announcement in scripture, whether it is the Old Testament or New Testament, it is not uncommon for the recipient of such an occasion to react with fear. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 17, the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar after hearing the voice of her son Ishmael. And the angel begins with, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is, end quote. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, the angel of the Lord says to Daniel, quote, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words, end quote. Earlier, in this very same Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 11, it is recorded that an angel appeared to the priest Zechariah, husband of Elizabeth, standing at the right side of the altar of Israel. Incense. And when Zechariah saw the angel, he was terrified, just like the shepherds. And the fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer 
has been heard. This blameless prophet prays and then for some reason is terrified when God shows up to answer his prayer. And if God never shows up to answer prayer, the devil is alive. Not only does the angel show up, but he says to the prophet, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 5, the angel of the Lord appears, rolls away the stone from the entrance to the sepulcher. And the scripture says that his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And whereas the fear shook the gatekeepers so bad that they became as dead men, but the angel told the women, fear not, for I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said. The shepherds in Luke 2 do not react outside of traditional behavior when they encounter an angel. They become fearful. But to me, their behavior would seem strange had they known ahead of time that Jesus was to be born and they were making preparation for the birth of the Messiah. Now, we have no clue as to the faith of the faith traditions of the shepherds. Scripture doesn't reveal to us whether they practiced some pagan religion, whether they were atheists, or whether they were Jewish. They have been adopted and had adopted the Jewish tradition of anticipating that God one day was going to send the Messiah to save his people. We don't have the luxury of knowing what they know or, be, or believe from a faith perspective prior to the angelic disruption of their night. All we know about the shepherds is that they were living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. That's all we know. And for me, that's where God's word today comes alive. When I read this narrative countless times previously, when I read it countless times previously, I got caught up in the reality of the joy of the shepherds after Jesus came. But as I told you already, God has situated us in the season of Advent. And for me, celebrating after Jesus comes isn't enough. Lord, thy kingdom come. Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is it, Lord, that the shepherds are frightened when the angel comes with good news? It's wonderful that eventually their terror turns to joy. But God, why is their first reaction negative? Why is a sudden divine intervening scary? And the spirit drew me to verse 8. They were scared because they were living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. In 2020, for too many of us, this has been the year of darkness. Decades from now, people will look back at this year as the year where globally humans struggled and where in America millions are just hanging on for dear life, waiting for morning to come. The shepherds are living in the fields. In good times, a shepherd is able to leave their flock unattended for periods of time to go rest in a cabin or seek food for his or herself. But when predators are lurking, shepherds must live in the fields. And I don't know about you, but when I think about our living in 2020, more than any other year in my 53 years of existence, I feel like we've been living 
just enough for the city, as Stevie Wonder would put it, or living in the fields, as the gospel of Luke pins it. In my mind, living in the fields contributes to why the shepherds are terrified when the angel shows up. Then the scripture teaches us why the shepherds were living in the fields. They were keeping watch over their flock at night. What I picture is a shepherd situated in a context that requires his constant protection over his livestock. For me, this has been a year of being preoccupied with just staying afloat mentally, spiritually, economically. The level of trauma we have endured plays into this fixation of surviving. We, 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 can't even, we can't even think about thriving. The higher the level of trauma, the less we are capable of dwelling on abundant living. And the more we are obsessed with acquiring basic needs. God says the devil wishes to sift us as wheat. What a better way to steal our joy and to kill us by death of a thousand cuts than by keeping us preoccupied with protecting the little that we got. Evil will never have to worry about God's people rising if we are barely making it from paycheck to paycheck. Week after week and month after month being stuck in a persistent mode of survival, survival practically makes dwelling in joy impossible. If the saying goes, weeping may endure for a night, it seems as though in 2020, nighttime for too long, for too many, has persisted like a marathon that never ends. When the pandemic first hit, many believed that by summertime, our nation would have turned the corner and be in a better place. And then, when that didn't happen, we set our hopes on the dream that by late fall as a country, we would have a handle on the virus. But the reality is, nighttime of living with COVID-19 has sustained itself. The virus has not only bought a long-term lease, setting up shop in practically every state in the mainland, it has begun to fatigue the residents of the territory who are becoming tired of wearing masks. But despite the fact that mask wearing and social distancing are the only current tools to keep the coronavirus from spreading like wildfire. In this kind of environment. Doesn't it seem almost absurd to talk about joy? Joy? What is there truly to be joyous about? Jobs are scarce. I can't freely interact with my family and friends. I gotta depend on Zoom. Everything requires so much work and meticulousness. If we are to stay healthy, it's hard to envision joy today. If joy comes in the morning, then maybe I'll be able to embrace joy. But if I make it through the night and see morning, then I can have joy. As the proclaimer of God's word, I believe that if we believe that Jesus is coming, then we must prepare for his coming. And when we dare to prepare, God's spirit will show up in our preparation and produce joy. Let me say that one more time. As the proclaimer of God's word, I believe that if we believe that Jesus is coming, then we must prepare for his coming. And when we dare to prepare, God's spirit will show up in our preparation and produce joy. 
After obtaining my Master of Social Work from Howard University, I worked for the Congressional Office of the Honorable Danny K. Davis in Washington, D.C. Just a few years into my tenure on staff, Senator Barack Obama then became president in November of 2008. Both Congressman Davis and then Senator Obama represented constituents represented constituents from the state of Illinois. And once President Obama won the election in November 2008, our office was flooded with phone calls. And in addition to the work of legislation, members of Congress from Illinois now had the additional burden of helping constituents support as they desired to come to D.C. for the inauguration in January of 2009. The workload was relentless. Chicago residents were stressed and anxious. Some were traveling by air, others were traveling by charter buses. Hotel accommodations needed to be organized. Staff for Illinois officers were working around the clock and it felt like we were always behind and never able to catch up and we were stressed and anxious but in spite of all the drama and all the stress we had joy the work was hard people were pulling us to our very last nerve Phones were ringing all through the night and it never felt like we really could help everybody. It, we were trying to do our best, but you know when you're trying to please everybody, somebody's going to fall through the cracks. And yet, we had joy. Why did we have joy? Because we knew that in January 2009, we were going to inaugurate the first black president of the United States. As hard as we were working Monday through Sunday, trying to do all that work in preparation, we all had smiles on our faces, we were giddy, and I even remember before then, all the hours standing in line going to vote, ours and all of us had smiles on our faces despite the suffering and despite having to stand. I saw women and men 20 and 30 years older than me couldn't wait to vote because they were prepared for what was happening to come. Now, who is Jesus? Who is the Messiah? Barack Obama cannot compare to Jesus Christ. And so, I'm saying today, I know it's hard, but if you prepare for the, if you just believe that God is going to show up and intervene in our reality, just the mere belief in it, is going to give you joy. <sighs> Praise God. Praise the Lord. After all the things I've been through, I still have joy. I have it because when I, whenever I've needed God to break in and show up and show out, He's never let me down. And so I'm just excited about what God is about to do. And so you know what? As hard as I worked for the preparation of the inauguration of Barack Hussein Obama, every December, Christians all over the world 
need to work hard and get excited about the inauguration of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I still have joy. Come on, suffering. It's okay because I know what's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know when you're going to show up. I don't know how you're going to show up, but you're going to show up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And so, I'm going to tell you, life is hard. But I still got joy. Because I'm preparing for God to show up and show out. And I'm trusting and standing on the promise. Amen, amen, amen. When preparation produces joy. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you again for your careful attention to this message. I pray that God's Spirit spoke to you right in your situation. The devil wishes to sift us as we he's got us so fixated on our problems that he's stolen our joy. But if you would dare prepare for God to show up, I promise you, you won't have to wait for joy. Just believing that God's going to show up will automatically transition your countenance. And so, the doors of the church are open. We offer Christ to you my brother, we offer Christ to you, oh my sister. He will give you brand new life, new life abundantly, oh come, come on, come up to Christ. That's the first invitation, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The second invitation is to join the body of Christ called Church here at Family of Faith. If you would like to take advantage of either of those two invitations, I'm asking that you would reach out to us via Facebook, our Facebook web page, Family of Faith USVI, all one word. Family of Faith US, V is in Virgin Islands and Islands. There you will find our contact information and you can reach out to us that way. Uh, also, if you would like to support this ministry, you can go to familyoffaith.churchtrack.com familyoffaith.churchtrack.com Track is spelled T R A. See, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and there you will find a link that you can click on and support and contribute to the ministry here at Family of Faith African Methodist Episcopal Church. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, we're going to transition now, and I'm going to stop the recording. But I pray again that God has blessed you in some way with this word. Preparation produces joy. Amen.